second row or the second row? That way she can pull herself up by the, uh, the, the, the pew. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, funeral service for Peter Van Dalen. Uh, on behalf of the family, we want to welcome you all here today, and also to the family that's gathered together, viewing on live stream, any friends and family out there. We also uh, want to welcome you to this service. We uh, know that uh, not everyone could make it, and so it is also um, appreciative, though, of your prayers, of your concerns already expressed to Rennie and Tina and the family, and uh, the death of Peter, uh, we thank you very much for that support. And we know, too, that there's some family members perhaps still on the way. And so when they get here, too, the, they can join us as we, uh, as we have this time together to focus on the comfort um, in God's Word. And so to begin with, just wanted to uh, have a, just a word of prayer, opening prayer, and then we'll get uh, started with the service. So let's pray together. O oh God of all mercy, God of all grace, we thank you that we could be gathered together here this afternoon in this church to be able to have our hearts comforted with your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would work powerfully in our hearts as well so that as we hear the words of Scripture read and as we take upon our lips these songs of our faith, that it would truly be a, a wonderful experience again of how you are working in us and how you lift us up when we are downcast and how even Lord in our weakness in our sorrow and our tears you strengthen us with grace you give us joy in our hearts and we pray that we would be encouraged by your word by the gospel today we pray for every one of the family members of Peter Van Dalen that you would encourage them also in their heart and in their soul give to them the comfort, Lord, that comes with knowing you and knowing that you are the God of the living and the dead and that you are the God who is also pleased to, to join with us even today and to come alongside of us in our grief, comforting us with your word. And we confess and praise you even as uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for you are the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Comfort us now in the hour of our need. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. First of all, we'll turn our attention to song, to praise the Lord, and we'll sing number 208 in the red uh, larger book in front of you, the Trinity Psalter Hymnal, number 208, All Glory Be to Thee Most High. And we'll ask everyone that if you're able to please stand and we'll join together singing all the stanzas again, number 208.
Please be seated. And welcome to the friends or family who just came in. We welcome you to the service, and I'm glad you made it here safely. We want to spend some time reading God's Word. We'll be uh, meditating on a portion later on from Romans 8. But before we do that, I wanted to read from Psalm 23 and then a portion of Psalm 90. If you want to follow along in your pew Bible, Psalm 23 is on page 862, page 862. Many of you might know this is a Psalm of David who he himself was a shepherd and knew exactly what it took to take care of the sheep and how much tender care and uh, help and guidance that they needed. And he uses that as an extended metaphor here as he's inspired by God uh, to speak about we as sheep who are taken care of by the Lord, our shepherd. Psalm 23, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then turning to Psalm 90, just uh, several pages forward to Psalm 90. <clears throat> we'll read there the first 12 verses. Psalm 90 is written by Moses, a man whom the Lord called to lead his people out of Egypt. Uh, and he was a man also, uh, a shepherd, <laughs> a man who knew what it was like to live in the wilderness and who was a man who knew what it was like to live without a home as so often he lived as a sojourner. And uh, you can hear that as well in the opening verses here as he longs uh, uh, for the Lord, focusing on the Lord as his dwelling place. And also Moses speaks very um, honestly and soberly about life and death and the power of death, but also the peace we have in knowing that God is the God in whom we live forever. Psalm 90, Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And for the moment, we'll read that far in God's Word. And let's join together in singing from one of the psalms that we heard, Psalm 23 in your songbook. It's number 23, and it's selection B, 23B. And again, we'll stand together and we'll sing those five stanzas. Thank you.
please be seated. And there's a couple more readings. Um, shorter passages we'll read before I read from the funeral meditation passage from Romans chapter 8. But first of all, this from John chapter 6, the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, a wonderful a passage of Scripture where Jesus reveals himself here as the bread of life. Later on in that passage, he declares these words, saying in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then turning to Romans 14, these Two verses from Romans 14, page 1765, just verses 7 and 9. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living, or rather, both the dead and the living. And now while we're in the book of Romans, if you are following along, just turn back a few pages to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll be considering God's word here today from this passage, and I think as you, if you're familiar at all with, with the book of Romans, it's a one of the books of the Bible that show us the way of salvation so very beautifully from beginning to end. It just shows us the, uh, the sin of man, the salvation God sends in his son Jesus Christ. And then after that, it provides some wonderful chapters from chapter 12 to the end of how then we're to live as Christians. And what we're considering today is only a very small portion of that and even a very small portion of chapter 8, which is considered to be sort of the, the high point and the peak of the entire uh, book of Romans. So much here that's, that's wonderful to behold as we look at how the, the, the story of the gospel is told and, and, and what the essence of the gospel is. And as it's been explained to me uh, so beautifully as well, it begins in Romans 8, chapter, or rather Romans 8 verse 1, where the Apostle Paul writes, therefore there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Because God sent his Son to save us from our sins. It begins with no condemnation, and then you look at how it ends, which is what we'll be considering in just a moment. Uh, there's no separation. It begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. And you think of what that means for us as Christians to know that our sins are forgiven in Christ, and therefore uh, we're uh, forever, right? guaranteed, eternal security uh, with God uh, because of what Christ has done, never to be separated from his love now and forevermore. So I wanted to read with you just uh, from verse 28 uh, to the end of the chapter, verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen it is God who justifies who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble 
or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we'll read that far in the scriptures. And before we... Uh, reflect a few moments on that. I also wanted to read this portion of the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 1, something that we memorize in the Reformed faith. We, we um, come to know the Catechism, we teach it to our children, and even we adults remember these, um, uh, these teachings as we grow older. But uh, if you want to follow there too, it's in the, sh the smaller book in, in your pews, the Forms and Prayers booklet. On page 201 uh, is Lord's Day 1, which, which is really the the theme of the entire catechism, one of comfort. I want to read this, if you can follow along. It starts, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And if you just pause right there a moment and, and try to answer that yourself, what is it that brings you comfort in life? What is it that brings you comfort? And then think of this, uh, of all those comforts, what's the most significant, the most important? And if you had to choose one, what would you say is your only comfort? Not only in life, but also in death as you lie at, at death's door. Uh, what's your only comfort in life and in death? And here's the answer uh, of a Christian, of a believer, that I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. He has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. And as if that's not enough, it goes on to say, because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And turning the page, and we just consider this actually last night in church, what must I know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? First, how great my sin and misery are. Secondly, how I'm delivered from my sin and misery. And third, I, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. And that again is what we confess from the Heidelberg Catechism. Dear family and friends of Peter Van Dalen, as you have heard from Psalm 90 and other passages perhaps that uh, we've even read by the graveside today, the Bible speaks very openly, very candidly, honestly about the subject of death. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 9, verse 27, it says that to each of us is appointed once to die and after that to face judgment. And that reminds us then that not only of the certainty of, of death, but also the fact that after we die, each of us will be called to stand before the, the judgment seat of God to give an answer for how we have lived. Something else that's significant about the way the Bible uh, speaks of death and treats death is that the Bible never treats death or speaks of death as something that is normal, something that is just natural. The Bible never uh, treats death or addresses it in a casual way or sort of in a, in a cavalier way, something that we just get used to, sort of like, well, it's really no big deal. You know, we lose a son, we lose a parent, uh, we lose a spouse. It's, it's no big deal. It's okay. We're all going to die. Um, it's going to happen to me someday too. We can't live forever, so que sera, sera, right? Whatever will be, will be. No, the Bible always treats death in a very serious way, in a very somber way. The Bible always treats death as a great loss, as an occasion for sorrow and sadness and grieving. And that, of course, is because of the way the Bible even begins. Genesis 1 tells us that God, our Creator, He made us. God, the great God of heaven and earth who made all things, breathed the breath of life into us and gave us life. And we were created to live, to enjoy this life, to enjoy fellowship and communion with God Himself who made us as well as others around us, with our loved ones. And so what does death do? Well, death puts an end to that. 
It puts an end to our fellowship and our communion. Death deprives us of the, the very things uh, we were created to enjoy. And so every death, we think of that every funeral, right, is a vivid reminder to us then that death is not natural. It is not our friend, but it is rather our great and final enemy in life. And I always think it's so striking that when Jesus Christ, God's own Son, walked the earth, he also saw death as the great enemy. We think of that when his friend Lazarus died. Jesus came to the place where they had laid him, and John 11, verse 35 says, Jesus wept. Here's the divine Son of God, the one who had power to raise Lazarus, who would in just a few moments raise Lazarus from the dead, and yet even Jesus paused to weep in the face of death, the great enemy of humanity. But as we Christians think about that, we also celebrate the fact, though, that Jesus Christ did more than just weep in the face of death. We know, we confess, we believe that Jesus came to earth to do something about death. And so he died on the cross and he rose from the grave on the third day to conquer death and to remove the sting of death as we confess and heard by the graveside even earlier today. And so that gives us hope, the hope of the gospel. And that's the hope that is set out before us and the wonderful promise of God's word that Jesus has won the victory over death. And all those who believe in him, even though they die, yet shall they live. So by faith, believing in Jesus Christ, God's Son, we too will overcome sin and death and the grave and hell itself. And so that is something that we believe from God's word, something we've confessed from the Heidelberg Catechism there in Lord's Day 1. Again, I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So we'll just reflect on these thoughts uh, this afternoon, looking at this powerful and this abiding hope that we have, this abiding comfort that we have as believers. And I want to share with you, just focusing on two things, two real reasons for our abiding comfort. First of all, it's this, the idea of belonging, that we belong to someone. And that someone is Jesus Christ. That's first, the abiding comfort we have of a belonging to Jesus Christ. I want you to think about that idea, that concept of belonging. One of the strongest feelings, desires, the innate, you know, that's something that just lives within us. Something that, that we have by, by nature, you might say. One of those desires is the feeling of belonging that comes with our humanity. The term belonging has been defined even as that, as an innate human desire to be part of something larger than ourselves. So you could say we want to belong. We need to belong. And we search for belonging in the world around us. And biblically speaking, we know this is an absolute fact. When you consider that God created man, God put in Adam's own heart and soul that sense of belonging, the need to belong, to belong to God as his own image bearer, to belong to his creator, to his Lord, and beyond that, to those that God would create after Adam. And Adam had that desire manifested itself, right? That, that desire to belong manifested itself in a love for God and in a need to commune with God and enjoyment of being in the presence of God, enjoying fellowship with God, God and man belonging together. Shortly after God created Adam, God said this, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper meet for him. It's not like God overlooked this little uh, detail of creation and then thought, oh, you know what, I think maybe Adam needs someone to live with. But rather God did that and he delayed the creation of Eve so that Adam could also see that he was alone. So that Adam could also sense his need of belonging to someone to commune with someone with God as well. So God we're told, created Eve, and he gave her to Adam to be his wife. And afterward, Adam says this, 
She is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In other words, she belongs to me. I belong to her. So the institution of marriage was ordained at that very moment. And God ordained that to address that deep-seated need within the heart of man and woman to belong. The family is an outworking as well of that desire as God puts children in families and families in communities. And even though many people in the world don't get married and, and they remain single, they have the benefit and the privilege of still belonging to a family or, or a group of friends. And beyond that, I think of the church, another institution uh, created by God. The church is even now being gathered. It's being protected and preserved by Jesus Christ from the very beginning of the world to the very end. To be a member of the church is to belong. It's to belong to God. It's to belong to the people of God. It's to belong to one another as brothers and sisters of Christ. In fact, I, I love the way Jesus puts that in, in the Bible. There are many ways in which this church, uh, the body of Christ, is illustrated or metaphors, so to speak. One is that of a body. Christ is the head and we're his members. But what Jesus says in John 15 is striking as well, where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man abides, there's the idea again of abiding, dwelling, remaining. If a man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But then he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, a vine, a branch that's severed from the tree has no life in it. It's cut off from the source of power and life and nutrition. That branch is alone. And alone it suffers. It can do nothing. It belongs to no one. And it no longer belongs. So even there in that illustration, Jesus picks up on that sense and the need we have to belong. And as we have come here today for this funeral, the funeral of Peter, it reminds us of this painful reality that in the world around us, even in our communities, in our churches, in our families, even the relationships we form in this life with friends and beyond that with those perhaps we went to high school or college with, all those to whom we belong eventually pass away. Our friends pass away. Family members Sometimes starting with great-grandparents and grandparents and parents. But as we know, it doesn't always follow that order, does it? Sometimes parents bury children, as painful as that is. And there are members of our church who are so advanced in years, and I've spoken to them about this, they say they're the only surviving sibling. <laughs> and all the friends they grew up with are gone. Most of the friends they make, uh, whether that be whether they live at Shalem or uh, their friend group, maybe here, even here at church, many of them, their age, have passed away. So death is a powerful, a sobering reminder to us that our desire to belong cannot be satisfied simply by the relationships we make in this world because we are here today and gone tomorrow. That's what Psalm 90 says. And as we bear witness, even the children we have that belong to us can be taken away. So there must be something more, right? We, we long for something more. We long for something more permanent, uh, for something that cannot be taken away, something that is lasting and eternal, that, that cannot be removed. And that something is provided to us in the gospel and the provision of God's only Son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. And the good news of the gospel is this, that in God's love, He sent His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, into this world so that through Christ and His suffering and His death on the cross, Jesus Christ could pay the price for our sins that we might be saved from God's wrath. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but Jesus paid those wages for those who believe in Him. And when Jesus rose from the dead... He rose to give us victory over the power of sin and death. So in other words, in his death and resurrection, Jesus undid the curse of sin, the very sin that severed us. You consider what sin did, right? It, it cut us off from the presence of God. It, it cut us off from, from eternal life, a holy God and an unholy people. But that's why God sent his son, that Jesus would come 
and bring those two together again. That by his suffering, by paying that penalty for us, that we might be brought near to God once more and, and joined to God again in, uni- in union and fellowship and communion. That we may belong to God, never to be separated again. And that's what this passage is, is getting at in, in some respects as well. I mentioned that already. Uh, we didn't read this, but therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Pointing out the salvation we have, the new life we have in Jesus Christ. And you look at verse 31 then. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who could possibly stand against us in this world when God Himself is is for us? The One who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. If He already gave to us His Son, Jesus Christ, then surely He will give us all things that we need. And then verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution famine, nakedness, or sword. You know, the good news for us is that Christ then restores us to God and satisfies that, that sense of belonging so that now no matter what we face in this world, as the Bible says, no matter what might befall us, even the very worst thing that man can do to me, no matter the worst thing the world could do to me, it cannot remove the single greatest comfort I have and possess in this world that I belong to God. I belong to Jesus for time and eternity. I belong to Jesus and I will abide with Him forevermore. Psalm 23, verse 6, we read that. You wonder, too, as, as David writes that psalm, and as I said before, he's a shepherd, and he's, the idea of the shepherd is he's leading the flock somewhere. He's leading them, taking them somewhere. Where, where is he leading them? Well, where the ultimate shepherd leads his people home, to be home again. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Belonging to God means in the end, dwelling with God. John 14, 1-3, Jesus tells his disciples these words shortly before he's betrayed and suffers and dies, but he wants his disciples to know that, uh, that he is not going to leave them nor abandon them, but that he will return and take them back to be with him. Listen to this, John 14, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. Why? That you also may be where I am. Belonging to God means being with God. What God Uh, created in the beginning God and man together in the garden that was broken by sin man even kicked out of the garden but God promises right there in Genesis 3 15 I'm going to send my son I'm going to send my son and my son's going to come and he's going to pay the price for sin so that once again what was in the beginning can be in the end so that God could restore man and reconcile him to himself through Christ. And we read this by the graveside, and if you don't mind, I'd like to read it again for you just to show you where this all goes, keeping in mind what I just said. Revelation 21, Then I saw a new city, or the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God. That's the the beautiful vision, right? The the idea of what God has made in the beginning is regained and restored at the end and even better. What a beautiful thought. What a wonderful comfort that is. Then in the end, in and through Jesus Christ, by faith in Him, man and God are restored and we are where we belong. Well, the second reason for this abiding comfort that we have is because we enjoy God's eternal security, eternal 
security. I want you to think about that idea again of security, as I mentioned already, the idea of belonging. Now, what about the idea of security? Isn't that also something else that we're sort of born with innately? This desire, the craving, I want to be secure. As I live in this world, I, I, I want security. Build a home. <laughs> Think of the, uh, was it the three little pigs? One builds their home of straw, stick, and brick. You know, you want, to, you want to build a secure home. Something that won't be blown down. Something that will stand. Security is something we crave. It's a desire. Something we strive for amidst all the unpredictability of this life against all the uncertainties of life. We want to be kept safe and, and insulated, secure from everything that's bad, that's evil, that's scary. And yet, there too, you see that man without God, man, when, once he turns away from God, what does he turn to for security? What are his options? Only the things that are in this world. Only the things that are in this world that, that pass away just like we do that are unstable, that fluctuate, that you know, might look really good today if you think about maybe you've built up quite a security in terms of your investments, <laughs> uh, maybe your retirement, uh, maybe your business, and yet you know how quickly that can fall. If you follow the market, you know how quickly those things can happen, how even the things that we build up for many, many years, looking like we've got a pretty good retirement, can fall apart in just a moment. So where is your security? Wherein does it lie? Wealth, career, retirement, life insurance, health insurance, all these other things we look to, eating right, living right. Again, all those things in the end, they fail us. And so you look at that as well. And, and, and where, we, where do we get this security? What does the Bible talk about? Uh, again, look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship? Yeah. You look at the things being asked, it's asking, can any of those things mentioned really and truly harm us? Uh, to be sure, there are many things in this life that can hurt us physically. You know, being a Christian, we don't confess that we're, uh, uh, we're Superman or Superwoman <laughs> or Wonder Woman, right? We're, we're all just as susceptible as everyone else to famine and persecution and danger, and nakedness, and sword. That's why the Apostle Paul is saying this. He's suffered many of those things, and God's people through the ages have suffered all of those things. As Christians, we're just as susceptible as everyone else to COVID, to sickness, to suffering, to illness, and death. And yet, the point is this. None of those things can truly harm us because none of those things can take away our true comfort and joy and hope and you think of the Apostle Paul who wrote this, you, you can just hear him bearing his heart. You were, we're counted as sheep to the slaughter. The Apostle Paul was well aware of, of the road he was on, that eventually his life would be taken for the sake of the gospel. He faced the constant threat of being put to death for his faith. The same threat posed to Christians today in Afghanistan. I mentioned that in the sermon yesterday. Uh, the American pullout, the military pullout, and the consequences it had. You think of the church of Jesus Christ there. So many Christians suffering now because the Taliban are going door to door and they're looking for those who dare to believe in Jesus Christ. The church grew. The church grew for many years there and now the church is being martyred. All those who do not renounce the name of Jesus Christ will be killed. And so the same troubles that were there on the day of Paul are in our day also. But what Paul is writing to these Christians here who face that very same reality and persecution uh, as he it, it is ultimately this, as unsafe and as unpredictable as the world may be, uh, the executioner's sword will not sever them from their hope, from their relationship, from their promise of eternal life and fellowship with God. Nothing, no one can change that or jeopardize that. And Paul would say, you can kill me with the sword, Daniel. You can throw me to the lions, Daniel's three friends. You can throw me in the fiery furnace. You can cast us all into the heart of the sea, but all that does is kill the body, this, this vessel of clay, but it cannot separate me from God's love. 
They cannot sever me from, from God's presence, from the great and precious promises of God, even for a moment. It can't steal away my joy and the comfort I have in knowing that I belong to God and to Jesus, my faithful Savior, in life and in death, for now and for all eternity. And that's why, even at the end, that wonderful boast that we're more than conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because of Jesus Christ, what he has done, Christ in us has conquered sin. Christ in us has conquered death. Christ in us has conquered the grave. Christ in us has conquered the dangers that we face in this world. And so this is a comfort that our Lord gives to his people, an eternal security that like hope, right, it, it can never be taken away. Do what you want with his body, but you can't steal away my hope. So we're safe and secure in the promises of God. And we're safe and secure in our Father's caring hands. I, I mentioned that at the beginning, and this is what I preached uh, yesterday morning from 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the Father of all compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. And we confess that this is the God who so watches over us. Not a hair can fall from our head without his will, without his knowledge, without his understanding. And so I hope those words come to you as great comfort today. That yes, our world is full of pain and misery, unpredictability and uncertainty. Perhaps some of us here today won't be here tomorrow or, or next year. We don't know that. And yes, we, we feel that misery this afternoon in a very acute way knowing as well as Rennie and Tina, you kept tabs on Peter, and as you would have those phone calls back and forth, sort of doing a welfare check, and then knowing that one time he wouldn't answer the phone. You shared it with me many a time that this was your, your fear, that one day he wouldn't answer the phone, and so now that's happened. And yet you live your life knowing that this is the comfort we have, this is also the dangers we face in this world. And yet we have an unceasing comfort that God gave to us, knowing that we who are living. This gospel's for us. We belong to Jesus Christ and nothing can separate us from that love. So if you have that comfort, praise God for it. But if you do not, then call upon God today. Ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, to fill you with his love and to give you faith to believe in Jesus Christ that you too can know this comfort at this moment. And from here on forward, so that you too can be with the Lord in glory. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to open your word today. And Lord, this is a wonderful passage and we can only touch on a very small part of it, but we do ask, Lord, that what we did here might serve to comfort us and give us that sweet consolation of the gospel, that you would work in our hearts, Lord, that we might have our hope strengthened, be encouraged as well, that we might have joy even in our sorrow. And Lord, again, as always, if there are those here or those listening who don't know you or perhaps who aren't sure of their faith, that you will give to them a saving faith through Jesus Christ, your Son. May your Spirit work in their hearts and in ours, creating faith in the hearts of those who do not believe and strengthening the faith in those who do. Call us to you again to see how blessed we are, what an abiding and amazing comfort we have in knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray, amen. We're going to conclude with number 343. Number 343, and I ask at the end of that that uh, if you remain standing, I have a short announcement to make, and then I'll just pronounce a parting blessing. So 343, what wondrous love is this? We'll stand to sing all the stanzas.
for those following in live stream, we thank you for joining us today. And for those who are here, uh, you'd like to know, the family would like to know that you're invited to a time of fellowship there in the fellowship hall. Uh, proceed to your right uh, outside the sanctuary. Uh, for the bathrooms, there are some to your left as well as some down the hallway to your right. And we'll uh, just depart now with this uh, parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you His peace. Amen. Amen.